I have so many heart attacks. If this is what it's like to have heart disease, I wish everybody would have heart disease. I had a doctor lecturing me back in 96 on how bad my diet and lifestyle was, but he was so overweight. And I said, if you're healthy and I'm not, I don't want to be like you. I can't deal with this anymore. And I was a really frustrated kid. I was so small and I was shorter than the girls, got picked on all the time. But when it came time to go to school, I didn't have the stress. I didn't have the anxiety that I always had. I went from being a C student to straight A's. So when it comes to sustainability, I mean, nothing compares to the carnivore diet. Food is fantastic. You never get tired of it. Can you imagine trying to be sustainable on that ridiculous vegetarian or vegan diet where you have to keep buying this stuff all the time and then you have to eat all the time? It's just such a process. This is so much simpler. Okay. Hey, good morning, everybody. Happy Thursday morning. Today, we have a special guest with us. We have Rick, who is joining us, who apparently has been doing a carnivore diet for at least a few months now. So <laughs> we'll get more into that. Rick, how you doing, man? Pretty good so far. Yeah. Where are you located, by the way, if you don't mind? Miami, Florida. You're in Miami. Okay. Miami's nice. A little hot this time of year, I would imagine. So this is maybe the one time you don't want to be in Miami, perhaps, but no, nice place. It's pretty much hot year round, but yeah. that's why we have good air conditioning. That's true. That's true. I've just kind of seen little snips of your interviews in the past, and it's quite a remarkable story, but I guess we'll just get started with it. You're how old are you these days? 55 years old. 55. So you were about the same age. I'm just 56. I got yep. you about just one year. And you have been doing a carnivore diet now for, I guess, somewhere upwards of 40 years, if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct? Yeah, I started in August of 1983, but I did have a seven-month vegetarian experiment in 1993. So you can subtract that from the carnivore diet. Okay, very interesting. Let's, let, let's get into that. So 1983, you're, what is it, 15, 16 years of age, something like that. What, why? <laughs> what would, what would propel someone to do that back then? Since we're about the same age and we probably grew up with the same, some of the same influences, you know that back then anything that had to do with eating a lot of meat or fat was considered to be bad, almost suicidal. And I was a really frustrated kid. I was so small. It was ridiculous. I was skinnier than anybody else and I was shorter than the girls, got picked on all the time. So my goal was either to grow big or just to die I didn't, I was in junior high, had a really bad time. And then high school was coming up and I thought, you know what, maybe I was desperate. Let's put it this way. And you know how teenagers can be. You can be really do some pretty crazy, unrealistic things. So I thought, why don't I just eat the worst possible diet? And the thing is, since I love meat is always the thing that I enjoyed since I was a kid, I was never really into the sweets or any of the other the cookies, the cakes or any of that stuff. So when I had gotten into the point where I was injured and I was unable to do much of anything and I had to cook for myself, it was like, I'm going to start eating nothing but meat. And that's where it started. Now, were there parents involved and in going, what the heck's going on here? Why are you only eating meat? What was the relationship at home? Yeah, my parents were involved. My father was very health conscious. He always wanted to make sure that I got the best of foods. I was given a lot of vitamins growing up. I was also given things like wheat germ, oatmeal, and there was some other nasty things, the brewer's yeast supplements and all that, that I had to take. The only supplement I actually enjoyed was cod liver oil. And once in a while, they would make liver for me, but the liver, the way my mom made it wasn't so good. But my parents did want me to try to gain weight, maybe get bigger, because constantly being picked on and being one of the smallest kids in school was really frustrating. But what happened was... That summer, I was helping my dad put up a carport. I fell through the roof. I broke my arm. I was stuck at the house. My mother was a teacher, so she had to go to university to renew her certificate, so she wasn't home to cook for. My dad was working, so I was pretty much stuck by myself, and it came down to my parents weren't, they weren't encouraging me to eat that way, but the main thing was I was able to cook for myself, and I was able to eat, and I seemed to be doing okay, so... I guess they just accepted it. You're eating, you're like, I'm going to eat the worst possible diet, just a bunch of meat because I'm unhappy with my position in life and maybe I'm going to die from eating meat, <laughs> put myself out of my misery. But 
at some point you, you had to realize that it wasn't working. You weren't dying. So at what point did you decide, Hey, this isn't working. I need to try a different strategy. Or did you start feeling better? Or how did you, cause you said you're the smallest kid in class at 15 years of age or something like that. What happened with your growth? Cause as ma males tend to physically mature a little later than girls, but many girls by 15 have reached their full adult height, whereas males by 16, a lot of them, sometimes 17, 18. But tell us what happened with the growth and what was happening to you that, that just, how was your body reacting to this? I had a few effects I never really thought much about. The first thing that happened to me is when I switched to this way of eating, I wasn't getting so upset. I was really, I was just I didn't know what to think. I was thinking about going to high school, getting picked on, having a really miserable time. But And I did start school a couple of weeks late because my arm was broken. But when it came time to go to school, I didn't have the stress. I didn't have the anxiety that I always had. When I was younger, I'd hate going to school. And it was always, my grades were really quite bad. I only had maybe a C average most of the time. But it seemed once I started eating this way, I wasn't really growing in any way. But it seemed like I was able to look at things differently. I started to look at the world in a different way. The little things that bothered me before just didn't bother me anymore. And then the other thing was it was fun because a lot of times, like if you're in the cafeteria eating food, I would look at what everybody else was eating and laugh. Before that, I had always been given peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and granola bars and all this other nasty stuff that I call duck food. But then when I was in high school, I was getting basically either lunch meat or a can of that chili. They used to have a real chili that it didn't really have any sweetness to it. It was just like tomatoes and meat. And eventually I started getting those little, I guess you call them Tupperware containers. There were the ones that you could, they were like different colors and you could put it together. And I was cooking up my own sort of ground beef stew, which was nothing but ground beef and water. And I would eat that there and people would look at me like, what, what is that? What's that's what I eat. I just eat meat. Sometimes I'd bring a steak to school. I'd put it in some aluminum foil and then I'd eat it cold. And the kids would laugh at me. Oh, how can you eat that? That's nasty. It's cold. But I, it just, it got to be a way of looking at the world. And then it was like when I would go home, I knew what I was going to eat because it was some kind of meat. And it wasn't until maybe later in 10th grade that I started to notice that I was growing somewhat. My feet got bigger. I didn't really get any taller, but I think I was starting to wear size 11 shoes at the time. And the other thing is that I didn't get tired like I used to. If I'd go outside and run around, somebody was trying to chase me, try to beat me up. I could outrun them and didn't get tired. It wasn't really much, at least that first year, but it's just slow improvements. And when I felt better and my parents had more time, it just, it didn't seem like I'd want to go back to eating the regular diet anyway. It was just tasting so good. When you get up in the morning and you get to eat three or four eggs and some cheese and maybe some bacon or a piece of meat, it's just you feel so good. You want to go to school. Before that, you get up in the morning, you got to eat that nasty oatmeal with milk poured on it. It looks like vomit. It's disgusting. You may have one or two eggs. I would always snap up the eggs first and leave the cereal for last. That'd be the last thing I shovel in my throat. And if I was lucky, I could throw it outside to the ducks before we got in the car to go to school. But as the year went on, it just became easier and it was very enjoyable. It was like, I'd look forward to eating. Before that, I sometimes I didn't want to eat because I didn't know what kind of nasty concoction I was going to have to stuff down my throat. But that was what I noticed at first. Yeah, there's people that actually enjoy oatmeal and think it tastes good and so on and so forth. So each has their own sort of opinion. And some of it's dependent. I grew up in a household where, I got to be honest, my mom was a horrible cook. <laughs> So we didn't have very, I wasn't exposed to the first time I had a good steak was, I don't know how many years later, but that that's uh, at what point did you decide or that, Hey, I'm just going to keep eating this way. You get into high school, you start feeling better. Maybe you start, how tall are you now, by the way, from the smallest kid in class to where you at now? I'm six foot six right now. Six, six. Okay. You're done growing by now, I assume, right? You're, you're probably. I would hope so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you're, you definitely grew quite a bit. And how did that, you, because you, you mentioned feeling bad and being picked on and maybe girls don't like you or something like that. How did going from the smallest kid in class to growing to six foot six and eating better and feeling better, how did that impact you, I guess, socially, mentally, that type of stuff? It's funny. Not too much happened in 10th grade, but the only thing that I did notice in 10th grade is that my grades, I went from being a C student to straight A's. 
So my confidence in the classroom went way up. And it was probably, I'd say 11th grade is when I really, I was starting to reach an average to above average height. I started to be taller than my parents. I just felt so much better. I would walk through the hallway in school and I was pretty much at eye level, everybody else. And as time went on, I just kept getting taller and taller. By the time I was in 12th grade, I was the second tallest in the school. I could look down the hallway. Life is different when you're tall than when you're short. When you're short and you're looking up at everybody, it's just as you're tall, it's just, it's like you're a whole different person. You get to enjoy the world. And then people start saying to you, how's the weather up there? Okay. I said, it's pretty much the same as it is down there, maybe just a little bit hotter. But no, it was, that was, and once you get into that, I never really thought about the diet. I, at that point, it was more like, I'm just doing this because it's convenient and it tastes good. And it doesn't seem to be hurting me. And this is when I think I really adopted it because I was going along and I was told all kinds of things like the nonsense about getting scurvy because you don't eat vegetables. It's going to stunt your growth if you don't eat healthy foods. Just all these things. And they were not true. I was getting taller. I was feeling better. I was actually getting stronger, even though I'm skinny. And it just, my confidence went way up. It was totally different. Elementary school wasn't so bad. Junior high was total hell. And then by high school, it started out being unpleasant, but it got to be enjoyable. And I originally, I wanted to drop out of high school and get a GED. But as I started to go through the high school system, I wanted to go to college. I wanted to earn a degree. So everything changed. It's, it's hard to describe. And believe it or not, I didn't even think about how much I was growing. This is the strange part. I was growing, but I didn't really think about it. It was other people that started telling me, how tall I was and making those jokes about, about your height. Then it all, I put it all together. By the time I was in 12th grade, I realized it had to have something to do with the diet because there's no way that I could have grown that much just on genetics. I think it was a combination of things. Genetics certainly have a role there. And then the environment and the food you provide allows you to reach your genetic potential. I would say that's fair to say. So you mentioned, so you've been 1983, it's now 2023. So we're 40 years later. You mentioned you did a seven-month period of veg vegetarianism. What prompted that particular, I guess, diversion? Considering that I had been on the carnivore diet for about 10 years to that point, I was still eating select vegetables at times. I would eat fruit in season when I didn't have enough meat. Sometimes the money was tight, but it was always whole foods. If I ate something other than meat, it was something that I got from my own yard or I got locally. But after Hurricane Andrew, our power was out and I had rigged up a generator. So everybody I know was giving me all their meats before they went bad. And I went on a total meat only diet. So from about the time of Hurricane Andrew, I gave the vegetables and fruits to my parents. I just ate nothing but meat. And I ate some of the best meats I ever ate in my life. I got spoiled with those ribeye steaks and the filet mignon and all the delicious seafood, the shrimp, the fish, all this stuff. I was just constantly, because it's we have a hurricane, I have all this meat, there's no fruits and vegetables available, why not? I just ate as much as I could. And the amazing thing was, unlike everybody else, I didn't get sick once. Everybody was, after the hurricane, they were getting sick from the mold and the colds that were going around, and I was fine. I was working, doing cleanup, doing repairs, I was constantly doing physical work, and I felt really good. So... Towards the end of the year, I have a few friends that they are, one of them is a vegetarian to this day. Some of them, they're more health conscious. My dad, I was living with my parents and they were giving me pressure. You're going to kill yourself. You're not going to, you can't live like this the rest of your life. And you're 24, 25 at the time. What, what are you going to do? I said, okay, fine. I'm going to try to eat more vegetables. And I thought, why go halfway? Why not go all the way? Why not just eat nothing but vegetables? So when I started the diet, I was still eating eggs and some dairy. For the first couple of months, I felt good. But then I started feeling tired and I didn't feel, I felt bad. I had to start getting some digestive issues, diarrhea, gas. But the gas was the worst part because I never really had that in my life. Sometimes you'd be somewhere, you'd be inside and then you get that pressure and you got to go and find a place to let the gas out. I had one time I was in an elevator and I had to let the gas out and everybody was like dying. So it was just not a great experience. So my vegetarian friend, she told me, you got to get rid of the eggs and you got rid of the dairy and anything that's not plant-based. So I started going completely plant-based between the veggies, the spinach, the fruits, 
carrots. I ate a bunch of carrots, just kept trying to eat as many vegetables as I could and just felt worse and worse. And then pretty soon I got a flu that was around July, around this time of the year, and it just knocked me down so bad. I couldn't eat anything. I felt terrible for a couple of weeks. And that was pretty much the end of my vegetarian experiment. Okay, fair enough. And then many people will say that a carnivore diet, a diet without fruits and vegetables and grains and carbohydrates is bad for you. Your brain, we need carbohydrates for our brain to function. It's not sustainable. Your thoughts on sustainability for this diet, having done it now for, I guess, four decades. (laughs) Sustainability. This is the most sustainable diet I've ever had, and in many ways. First of all, the food is fantastic. You never get tired of it. What person could get tired of having steak and seafood and even chicken? As long as it's good meat, it's just so delicious. It's You just you never get tired of it. And the other thing is that you don't waste a lot of food. Unlike the vegetarian diet, and if you know any vegetarian, they're constantly throwing away food that went bad or scraps or whatever. The carnivore diet is just, there's no waste. Any little scraps you have, you can feed to your animals. A lot of the stuff you can put into the compost pile, but there's just so little left. You keep most of your food in the freezer so it can stay for months before you're ready to eat it. And then it's just so simple. You go to the store, you walk right to the back of the store, you buy your meat, and you can stock up when it's on sale. And up until recently, it was the cheapest diet in the world. So when it comes to sustainability, nothing compares to the carnivore diet. Can you imagine trying to be sustainable on that ridiculous vegetarian or vegan diet where you have to keep buying this stuff all the time and then you have to eat all the time or you have to grind it up with a juicer or whatever else they're doing? It's just such a process. This is so much simpler. Yeah. And so what does your diet look like? Uh, obviously, maybe over a period of 40 years, there'd been some changes a little bit, but what it, can you summarize your diet for the last 40 years? What has it essentially been? Well, believe it or not, it hasn't changed as much as you would think. In fact, right now I'm cooking my lunch and my lunch is basically just ground beef mixed with water in a pot. And I turn it on the fire. I let it cook slowly, stir it up now and then. That's my lunch. And I'll eat that along with some cheese. Breakfast is usually anywhere from four to 12 eggs, and then I'll have a piece of meat. It'll either be pork or beef, usually like a pound of meat to go with it. And dinner, that could be anything. I used to have a lot of seafood for dinner. When I lived down in Key Largo, I would get fresh fish or shrimp or something like that. But now it could be more beef. Basically, beef is number one. If I have it, I eat it. And then number two would be some type of pork or poultry. Usually pork is pretty cheap. So if I do eat pork, it'll usually be for dinner, but it's it hasn't really changed that much. I eat three times a day. I've done that pretty much my whole life. I'm not into this fasting or any of these other one meal a day. I can't go on one meal a day. I eat so much food. I can eat four pounds of meat in one sitting. Can you imagine you eat all that at one time. I'll be sleeping for two hours afterwards, but normally three times a day, it's always going to be about the same. Yeah, fair enough. And the same thing, I like I said, I eat, I can eat quite a bit of food and one meal a day is tough because it's hard to get all that you need in one meal for a lot of people. And I guess the question is, clearly you have, you're full of heart disease. There's no way that's, there, it's no way possible that you could eat meat every day for 40 years and tons, three or four pounds a day and not have heart disease. So tell us about the heart disease you have. Oh, I'll tell you, I have so many heart attacks. I don't know what to say. Of course, the heart attacks that I have are actually heart attack burgers. And what they are, it's a four patty burger. They're half pound patties a piece with eight slices of cheese, maybe bacon if I have it. And I make the buns out of pork rinds and eggs and cheese. So that's about the closest thing I come to a heart attack. I actually made a couple of comedy videos that I put on my channel showing faking a heart attack. But I'll tell you one thing. If this is what it's like to have heart disease, I wish everybody would have heart disease because I get up in the morning, I got plenty of energy, I can do anything, I can outwork 25-year-olds that I sometimes work with, and I don't have any other, I don't have any symptoms. Hey, I'm sure one day I'm just going to drop dead because that was my goal in the beginning. I would rather die of heart disease than something like cancer. I don't know. You tell me if this is what heart disease is like. Are you currently, do you have to currently take any medications or anything like that? I haven't been to a doctor since 1996, so I don't even know if I would need a medication. 
No, I don't take anything. Okay. And do you ever like routinely draw blood work or anything like that? Is it something you're interested in or not really? I, you know what? I, I would be interested in it. I just don't want to have to deal with a doctor because every time I go to the doctor, it would make my blood pressure go up and I get angry. I had a doctor lecturing me back in 96 on how bad my diet and lifestyle was, but he was so overweight. And I said, I basically told him, I don't remember the exact words, but I said, look, if you're healthy and I'm not, and, and you are obese, I don't want to be like you. I can't deal with this anymore. So I just didn't do it. But it would be interesting to see what is actually going on inside of my body. I don't even know my blood type. So who knows? And just for your six foot six, how much do you weigh these days? Do you know? I weigh 190 pounds, more or less. Okay. So you're clearly not obese. You're, you're, oh, no. <laughs> it's a long way from <laughs> I've that. I've never been obese. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. And then as far as you said, you cannot work your coworkers that are in their 20s. What kind of work do you do? I, at this point, I do mostly physical work. I've done a lot of different things. When I went to college, I studied electrical engineering, but I never got any employment in that except for teaching at the college. I taught at Miami Dade College from about 2000 to 2013 until they changed the program. My first business was in IT. We used to set up networks and servers and stuff like that. And then the second business, I worked with a friend of mine. We did security cameras and DVRs. I took care of my parents for almost 10 years when they were sick. So I just did side jobs after that. And to this point, I've been doing side jobs. Most of what I do is cleanups. I do trash outs on properties. Sometimes I'll do outdoor work. It depends. So it's a lot of physical work, a lot of loading and moving stuff around. I also repair equipment. I repair things like skid steers and excavators. And I do work on some cars. I don't like working on cars, but I do some repairs. So it's when I work on my own all the time. In fact, I just pulled the transmission out of my truck a few months ago. I do all the work by myself. So it's mostly a physical type job. You obviously, you say you've been doing this since the 80s, the early 1980s. And in recent times, particularly over the last, say, five years or so, and even more so today, we're hearing this sort of increasing popularity of this quote-unquote carnivore diet. This is something I named it the carnivore diet. When you were doing it back then, you probably had it called something else, and as people call it zero carb and whatnot. But what has been your sort of, as you've been seeing this evolve over the last few years, have you had, have you been surprised to see its popularity and its increase? And what are your thoughts on that? It's interesting you mentioned that because you're one of the people that made me aware that there is a carnivore diet. You and of course, Paul, the fruity guy, they, I saw the two of you first when I went online. I don't spend as much time online as I should, because I was mostly outside. But when we had the virus, I was stuck in front of the computer. And I used to call it the heart attack diet. And I don't know if you're familiar, there's a restaurant in Las Vegas called the heart attack grill. So I was looking at that. And I was laughing because I always thought that guy is a riot. John Basso is always making fun of the food that people eat. But yeah, I eat a lot like that, except there's a difference. I don't eat I don't eat the sugar, I don't drink the coke, I drink water. When I make my heart attack burger, I don't use bread. I typically use pork rinds cuz I wanted to make it as shocking as possible. So I always called it the heart attack diet. That's what I called it. And when I ate my burger, I called it the heart attack burger. And I used to think of Fred Sanford, Sanford and Son, he's always saying, "Oh, I'm having the big one. I'm going to have a heart attack." So I used to make fun of that. I tease people. Oh, you don't feel good? I said, yeah, I think I'm having a heart attack. Oh, I feel terrible. So I called it the heart attack diet and I had a lot of fun with it. So it wasn't really anything serious. But when I saw you and I saw other people out there talking about a carnivore diet, I thought, man, that's exactly what I'm doing. The difference is I don't call it a carnivore diet. And then I started to look at your videos. And back then you didn't have what you do now. You're basically just at your home talking the squeaky chair. I remember that. And I was impressed. I thought, wow, this is incredible. And the more I looked around, the more people I saw that were into it, it just became, I don't know, it became addictive. And I started commenting on a bunch of these videos on the carnivore diet. And the first one that anyone responded to me was the carnivore camaraderie, which was Joey. And he was the one that wanted to interview me. He says, oh, I got to interview this guy. And when he did interview me, it went to you wouldn't believe how many people watched that video. It was thousands and thousands of people. And I was just shocked. I thought, man, I can't believe this. So then I got more and more involved. I more and more people contacted me. I did several other interviews. And eventually I got the 
Barquet and Anthony Chafee and a few others. And it's just, now I think about it more than ever. I never, for years, I never thought about it. It's just, I go somewhere to eat. Oh, what would you like to eat? Oh, you got some meat. Oh, would you like some bread? Nah, I don't want bread. Usually I'd go to the all you can eat, like the buffet. I'd hit the meat. I wouldn't touch anything else. And I, I never thought about it. It's just the way that I ate. And anyone that knew Rick know that he only likes to eat meat. They'd laugh at me. Don't bother to make bread or anything. Just throw a steak on the grill and he'll be happy. And then I have a reputation for being a very large eater. How much meat can this guy eat in one sitting? Oh, he can eat two pounds. Oh, easily. I could eat three pounds. I could eat four pounds. And being skinny, you can fool a lot of people. They have no idea how much you can actually eat. Then they say, oh, he must have a hollow leg. So it just went from one thing to the other. And now that I'm aware of the diet, I realize that I'm probably one of the more unique carnivores out there in many ways. Yeah, there's been a few people. There's getting, they, they call him Owsley Stanley, the bear. He apparently had done it for some 50 some years before he died in a car wreck in his mid 70s. And a few other people I know, there was a rancher up in Canada that Anthony, my friend Anthony Chafee, interviewed a while ago. She said she's been doing it for 60 years. And the Harvard University study had someone in the study that did it for 28 years. And so we certainly know there's some of these examples. And then again, of course, if you look at some of these historic populations, Inuit, Sami, Nene populations, yeah, they're basically doing it for millennia, basically, for their whole lives for the most part. And so it's not as unusual as you think. But Still, in the Western framework, it's still considered unusual. What, so you mentioned all your friends, like you're, the, you're this funny guy that just eat, me, eats meat all the time. Have you ever had any sort of really negative outside of the doctor? What was the doctor telling you, by the way? You said you didn't want to go back to the doctor since 1996 or whatever. Were they telling you you're going to drop dead of a heart attack or what was the concern? He was concerned about heart attack and stroke. The thing was that when the nurse checked my blood pressure, it was 90 over 60, which is what it usually is. And he was saying that it was too low. And I said, you got to check it again. And it went way up. So it was higher than normal because I was getting angry. So I tried to explain to him. I said, my blood pressure, I check it all the time. It's fine. He says, and then he's asking me questions. Oh, do you ever get dizzy or tired? I said, no, I could sit down and I can stand up immediately. I don't get dizzy. But he was telling me stroke. And then they're looking at the blood work. Oh, your cholesterol is too high. It's over 200 and something. And I don't remember the exact number. Your cholesterol is too high and your blood sugar is too low. It was like 70 or something like that. It, just a bunch of nonsense. I, I didn't care. So yeah, he's just trying to scare me with numbers. Okay. So you had normal, normal to low blood glucose, normal to low blood pressure, elevated cholesterol. And like I said, it's one of those things where without imaging your heart or your coronary vessels, we can't say for sure, but there's a lot of people that die of heart attacks in their fifties. And one would expect that someone like you eating all the saturated fat based on conventional, I wouldn't call it wisdom, but the conventional way of thinking would be somebody that, that has that. And have, what is your work capacity like as far as do you get winded easily or able to just do whatever you want to do? I don't think I've ever been winded in my life. What happens to me is when I work too hard, I start to get hot and I get overheated. I sweat so much that my clothes are just completely wet. And then it starts, the heat builds up and I start feeling hot. The other thing that'll happen is if I work really hard, my legs will start to hurt. If I'm going up and down the stairs, carrying heavy objects, they'll start to hurt. I'll have to sit down for a little bit until they feel better. But I don't think I've ever been out of breath. The only time I was out of breath, one time I was being chased by a dog and it was a pretty big, I don't know if it was a pit bull, but it was a pretty large dog and I outran him. And then I climbed on top of a car and I was breathing hard. And another time my car broke down and I pushed it like maybe half a mile. I had to go from the corner over to the house. And by the time I got home, I just laid on the ground. I was breathing hard. It takes a lot of really intense work to make it where I have to catch my breath. So it's very rare. Yeah. So it sounds like you're in fairly decent condition there. What is, have you ever had since you, a lot of people suffer with mental health issues, things like that? Have you always been pretty happy and upbeat since, since being, I guess, since a teenager? Yeah. My parents used to criticize me. My dad used to call me a robot because a lot of times things would start going wrong and I wasn't getting upset. One time our kitchen was on fire and my parents were having a total breakdown moment. And I just grabbed the fire extinguisher and put it out. We've had times where the car broke down. We had the fuel pump go out one time. 
and I was with my dad, he was blowing up. And I just said, you know what? There's an auto parts down the street. And I walked to the auto parts and changed the fuel pump. I've had, my vehicles are old. They break down all the time. I drive around more than 50 year old car. My truck is 30 something years old. I run into problems constantly and I always find a way to deal with it. I've had trouble, just things that would drive other people over the edge. I don't let it, I don't let it bother me. I, once in a while, I'll get mad. If something really aggravates me, I'll go out there and break it. I had one time my lawnmower kept stalling and was driving me crazy. And I, I picked it up and I threw it on the ground a few times. I ended up ripping it apart, knocked the engine off the deck. So there are times when I'll get mad. And I had one time where I had a tire go flat and it rolled away from me and I got mad. And I think, I don't know, I think I broke something. But most of the time, not so much. And I've never been able to feel like I have friends that get depressed and they don't feel like doing anything. I'm always the one that has to go over there and give them an encouragement because otherwise they'll just sit there all day. The only time I don't go and do something is if I got the flu and I'm stuck in bed, I got a headache or I feel like throwing up. That would be the only time. Other than that, I really don't get upset. I don't get those mental issues that some of the people I know that get. When was the first time you ran into somebody that also ate like you or did that happen prior to recent times now you're talking with people and did you ever encounter anybody else who was eating similar to you technically no but i do have a friend who he was into bodybuilding at the time and he was eating the regular bodybuilder diet with the rice and the pasta and all that but he had all kinds of digestive issues and then he was struggling with staying lean so we were friends for a while and eventually he asked me because i want to see how you eat and he saw the way that i ate and he knew me for years. I first met him in, I think it was 93. And then I lost contact in 95. I met him again in 98. And I think it was 2000. He switched to the same kind of diet that I have, the carnivore diet with meat and eggs. And to this day, he still does the diet. And he's what, 40, 48, 49, somewhere around there now. And he's still quite lean. He's too private to come out and talk about the diet, but that's the only other person I know. And he's had excellent results. I do have another friend that started to eat the carnivore diet, but he's in his seventies and he had so many health issues, including bypass surgery and all that. He was improving, but then he started to get weak. And now I think he's in rehabilitation, but that's pretty much it. I haven't personally met any other carnivores to this point. Yeah, it, it, and they're definitely out there now, and we're, the numbers are growing every single day. What, you know, as far as sourcing your meat, you said you some people had gifted it to you during Hurricane Andrew, which I can't remember what year it was, but I think it took, didn't it wipe out Homestead? I remember, I think that was the big place that it really hit over there, which is just south of Miami. But have you made a big focus to only consume grass-finished meat or stuff like that, or has it been just more whatever you like type of stuff? The hurricane was in 92. It was August of 92. I really have rarely eaten grass-fed meat. The only time I ate grass-fed meat was when I was younger. We used to have some cattle ranches around here. Now it's all development. It's all these crummy zero lot line homes and shopping centers and all this other nonsense. But back then, sometimes they would slaughter an animal. I would collect the fat. I'd collect all the pieces that were left over that they would normally throw away and I'd render that to get some beef tallow. But that was the only time I had grass fed and I actually enjoyed it. It tastes almost like duck in a way. Duck has a dirt taste to it. It was like that. But no, most of the meat I get now, when I was younger, I used to hit the dumpster back then. Now they have the dumpster where you can't get to it. When I was a kid, you hit the Grand Union or the Wind dixie they'd throw out meat. I'd collect it to give to my pets or to the ducks and I'd eat a lot of it myself because it was free. And it didn't, if it didn't smell bad, I'd go ahead and eat it. At this point, I just get whatever's on sale. For example, here's one of our local supermarkets, and they have this meat over here on sale. It's two seventy eight a pound. I'll buy one of those, maybe fifty, sixty dollars at a time, and then I'll cut it up. I'll eat some of that, put some in the freezer. I basically whatever meat I can get that's affordable to me is what I'll buy. And I do hunt some of my own meat. Once in a while I'll have duck or iguana or something that I can get, maybe go fishing, catch some shrimp or something. So it's a mix of what I can get. Iguana. <laughs> I know they got some iguanas running around Florida down there, but how is that? Are you, I guess you can, they're invasive. So I guess they don't mind if you hunt them. And how do you prepare with iguana? That's the thing. The iguanas, they were eating. I have a garden in my yard. I grow fruits and vegetables. I grow a lot of fruits and vegetables. 
And that's the other thing that people used to laugh. They come in my yard, you walk up to the front door, there's big banana bunches hanging over your head. There's tomatoes growing on the fence. There's oranges, there's all this fruit. And what was happening is I had a papaya tree. This girl that I know that's a vegan, she loves papayas and the iguana was eating the papayas. And I thought, I got to get rid of this stupid thing. And I was trying to chase it off. I couldn't get rid of it. So I ended up hitting it with a shovel and I killed it. And then I looked at it and I thought, well, I can bury this thing. But I thought, that is, that's meat. And I've had snake before. So I thought, oh, let me see if I could cook this thing. And I cut it up. I cooked the legs. I boiled it in water to get the skin off of it. I cooked the tail and it was actually very tasty. So from then at that point on, I looked at an iguana as a food source. So instead of being something invasive, it's something I can catch and cook. And boy, is it good, even if it's boiled. But if you want to make it taste better, you can boil it first and then you can batter it and fry it. You get some pork rinds and some eggs and you make a batter and dip the meat in there, cook it up in some beef tallow. Oh, it's so good. It's somewhere between fish and chicken. It's just it's amazingly delicious. You wouldn't believe how tasty a lizard could be. <laughs> Interesting. I guess I've had alligator. I've had fry. I think I've had alligator on a stick one time when I was in New Orleans. So I, it's been years since I've had anything like that. So it's interesting that uh, eating the maybe, maybe if they ban cows, we'll all be eating iguanas or something like that. Perhaps I don't know. <laughs> Do you? You said you hadn't spent a lot of time on the internet. Now you're doing it more. Are you surprised by any of the stuff you're seeing? Uh, with regard to meat is killing us or any or anything within the carnivore space that you've seen? Because there's people that make certain claims that maybe they're dubious, but anything that you say that doesn't sound right to me? Believe it or not, I think in the carnivore space, there's more real people than you'd find like in the vegan space. The, the vegan space is really frustrating because there's one guy out there that's always talking about a raw vegan diet and he aggravates me. Because he's got some kind of filter on to make his skin look good. And he talks about how raw makes him feel good. And he goes to the gym and does this and that. And every vegan I know is just miserable, just constantly miserable. In the carnivore space, people that they show you pictures of what they look like before. They may be three, four, five hundred pounds. They may be in bed, sick, unable to move. Well, there's people out there that were practically paralyzed. There are people who had eating disorders and all these issues. And then they switch to the carnivore diet and they heal. It's incredible. I can't believe when I see this, I think to myself, man, when I started this diet, I never even knew. I figured that by this age, I would have been dead, gone already. But now I see all these people out there, they're reversing health issues just by switching the diet. And then, of course, once you switch the diet and you feel better, then you change your lifestyle. Then you become more calm. Then you have better relationships with people. Maybe you start exercising. It's I'm really pleasantly surprised. Let's put it that way. I haven't seen too many scammers in the carnivore field like you would see with the vegans or some of the other people selling supplements. Because really, when it comes down to it, what is a carnivore diet? It's a diet that doesn't require supplements or any snake oil or anything like that. You can eat a carnivore diet right now. The only thing you might need is encouragement from other people. You don't have to go and get some special melon from some mountain or some snake oil potion from some foreign country you could just eat meat and you could change your life it's it's incredible to me and every time i see another new carnivore video it's just more encouragement for myself yeah with regard to i guess you'd mentioned as a kid your mother was bad at making liver and is this something you are you much of an organ meat person because there are people selling organ meat pill supplements which i think is in my view is a little sketchy but what are your thought around? Do you consume regularly organ meats or is that something you just, you don't care about? It depends. When it was cheap, I would eat a lot of it. In fact, even in 2020, they had liver for 69 cents a pound for beef liver. So I was eating probably a pound of liver a day at some times, but I don't like the problem with liver. I don't like it overcooked. I like the liver cooked very little. And sometimes I would eat raw liver when I was a kid just to gross people out. I would take liver with me in a cooler to high school. And when the kids are there eating, I pull out the raw liver and it's all juicy and all that because it's been soaking in lemon juice and I'd eat it and everybody go, oh, how disgusting. It was a way of grossing people out. I ate a lot of liver when I was younger. Now, I haven't had any liver for months now, but I would always put a little bit of liver in with the ground meat. But I never really noticed the difference, whether I was eating just steak or I was eating liver. Remember, in, in 92, when I ate 
only meat. I didn't eat a single piece of liver at all. And I've had times where I went the whole year without eating liver. Sometimes I'll have poultry liver. I like duck liver, especially when you get a big fat duck because it's a really nice texture to it. But it varies. It's just one of those things. If I have it, I eat it, but I don't have to eat it. Yeah, fair enough. And then you you mentioned duck, which is surprisingly good for those that haven't had much duck, particularly duck breast. It almost has a red meat-like flavor, I think, in many cases. Where do you get your duck from? Is that something you hunt or is that something you buy at the store? I've never bought a duck. All the ducks that I've eaten, I catch from the canal or I catch from my yard. I have my own little collection of ducks. There's probably 20 or more ducks that hang around the house. They're invasive down here. They're called the Muscovy duck. They're not the mallard duck that's that's a game animal. It's just something that roams around and eats bugs and garbage, whatever you can get it. Any food that I don't want to eat, I usually throw it to the ducks and let them pick through it. And if they don't eat it, it goes in the compost pile. They also eat a lot of grass, weeds. They eat plant material. They're basically like a disposal system. It's like having a flying pig, basically. So you can feed them almost anything and they'll eat it. And they're entertaining. And I love the ducks. I'm duck fanatic. Around my house, there's all kinds of duck-themed items. You'll see I have duck bookends. I have duck duck decorations all over the place. My yard is full of ducks. Yeah, I I will basically catch my... Oh, there you go. I have a candle that's about that size. Yeah, so somebody <laughs> sent me a wooden duck decoy and I'd, I'd throw it up here just for fun. One of the, one of the guys that runs a cattle ranch outfit out there but so as far as what about duck eggs you're able to get eggs out of those ducks or that too hard oh oh, yes i love my duck eggs i try to have as many eggs as i can now there's not that many eggs because it tends to be seasonal but i just picked yesterday i found eight eggs what i do i look for the nests and i harvest some of the eggs i leave a few i usually leave them three or four to sit on and raise ducklings and maybe half will survive I try to keep the population stable because the problem with the ducks around here is that if you don't control their population, they multiply rapidly and you can end up with a hundred or more ducks in your yard and they are really destructive. They will eat everything in sight and the duck poop, it just covers everything. That's one of the reasons why people hate them. But in my yard, it's really not that bad. Yeah, there's duck poop out there and they eat a few weeds and stuff. But yeah, whenever I can get the eggs, they're better than the chicken eggs. I'll try to have, if I do collect the eggs, I'll have maybe two duck eggs and maybe three or four store-bought chicken eggs. We also have feral chickens around here. Those eggs are awesome. They're a little small, but they're good. They have a better flavor than what you get in the store. And another thing that people don't know is that roosters are very tasty. If you ever eat wild rooster, it's nothing like that crappy chicken you get in the store. It's somewhere between duck and regular chicken. It's really flavorful. It's a little tough. It's good. And the same thing with the ducks. When I eat the ducks, I generally eat the male ducks, not the female ducks. The female ducks are egg layers and they tend to be smaller. And the other problem is if you have too many male ducks, they fight all the time. So I'll select the most friendly and the best with the ducklings. And then I'll eat the ones that are aggressive. And that meat is just like steak. It's not very fatty. That's the only bad thing about the duck meat. But boy, is it flavorful. It's oh. Once you've had it, it's just amazing that other people don't eat it. I guess it's the best kept secret around here. You mentioned issues with not having enough fat. And so how do you get adequate fat? Because in the absence of carbohydrates, you got to get energy from somewhere. And I estimate most people are getting somewhere between 60 and 80% of their calories from fat on a carnivore diet. So how do you make sure you get enough fat in? When I buy my meat, I tend to buy the cheaper meats. The ground meat that I buy is all 70, 73% lean. So there's a lot of fat in that. I don't cook on a grill because when you cook on a grill, the fat runs out. Generally, my ground meat will be stewed. And if I do make burgers, I make them on a griddle on the stove. And I will collect the fat to pour back on the burger. Sometimes I'll add fat to it. I'll add lard to my burger or beef tallow. And the few times that I make fries, which is maybe two or three times a year, I'll fry plantains from the yard in beef tallow. And then, of course, I eat a lot of butter when I have my eggs. There's going to be at least a quarter stick of butter that the eggs are swimming in. Plus, I do eat pork and I tend to, I love the pork skin. I'll buy the pork shoulder, cut that off, put that in the convection oven. And I'll use that either to make buns for the heart attack burger. I'll just eat them separately. So I try to keep as much fat as I can, and I don't know what percentage I'm getting, but I'll tell you one thing. I got a lot of energy. 
Good for you. Have you ever had any downsides that you can think of from this diet? Have you ever been had any major illnesses or sicknesses or anything like that over the last 40 years you've been doing this? The only time I really got sick is when I had that flu in 93. I don't really get sick. If I do catch the flu, it's usually like I don't have any energy. I'll get up in the morning. Sometimes I'll get dizzy when I'm catching the flu and I'll feel like throwing up. Most of the time I don't throw up. I think one time I had, I went with some friends to a steakhouse and it was one of those all you can eat Brazilian steakhouses and something was in the meat that didn't agree with me. And I had like gas and I felt like throwing up and I actually did throw up the next morning a little bit, but it wasn't really meat that I threw up. It was just a gag reflex or something. I don't know what that was, but believe it or not, I really haven't had any major problems. In fact, in 2000, 2000, was it? 2020, one and two, I got the virus three times because I tested positive for it. But other than feeling tired, I had a headache the first time for a few days, second time, maybe a headache for a couple of days. I didn't have the coughing. It's very rare. I can't remember the last time I had a coughing problem. And when I was a kid, I used to get sore throats all the time. At the drop of a hat, I'd get a sore throat. But since I've been on the diet, I don't get sore throats anymore. I also used to get ear infections when I was younger. I don't get that either. In fact, I cut myself all the time. I just cut myself two days ago when I was moving some trash on a piece of rusted metal, and it's already healing. So it's amazing that I don't run into the same problems. I got friends that have foot fungus and all that stuff. I don't get that. I don't get bitten by mosquitoes hardly at all, and I don't get sunburn. Yeah, interesting. I've heard a lot of people comment, particularly on the sunburn one, that their sun tolerance improves significantly. And you're in a very sunny place. Miami is just plenty of opportunity to get sun there. What about, do you have, have you lived in the same kind of place, the same location for quite some time now? Yes. I was actually born and raised in this house. I have my own house, which is a different location that I moved to. And then I came back here to take care of my parents. But I've been in the South Florida area my whole life. I've never lived anywhere else. And do you have like neighbors that come over for barbecues and stuff like that? Or what do you interact with people around you and you have a bunch of meat? I do have neighbors and I'll go. Well, we used to have barbecues here all the time. And we even had movie night many times. I have a popcorn machine in my living room. So I would make them popcorn. And of course, we'd have the barbecue to go with it. And they, there's a lot of Cubans around here. So they love plantain. So I cook plantain fries. But yeah, we would have many get togethers. Now, a lot of them have moved away. I do have one neighbor and I have a friend of mine down the street that we have barbecues together. And usually we'll have a primitive pit barbecue in his yard. We'll dig a hole in the ground, put a grill over it and then cook some steaks on there. So yeah, it's once in a while, not as much as I'd like, but we do have get togethers from time to time. Yeah, fair enough. Oh, do you, you mentioned supplements. Are you taking any kind of supplements, vitamin D or any supplements or anything like that? The last time I took supplements is when I went on the vegetarian diet. I haven't taken any since 1993. Okay. And you seem to be holding up pretty good without that. No digestive problems. A lot of people will say carnivore diet lacks probiotics and prebiotics and fiber, and therefore our gut microbiome is going to be messed up. Do you have any kind of digestive issues? No, I've never had a digestive problem, except when I get the flu. When I get the flu, sometimes I'll get diarrhea, I'll get gas, but normally, no. And I go to the bathroom at least once a day, sometimes twice, but very rarely. If I've crammed myself with a bunch of meat, I may have to go twice a day, but not once a day. I've never been constipated. I've never had any major problems. I don't even think about it, really. I eat, and then a lot of times when I have to go to the bathroom, it's going to be it takes maybe two or three hours before I really have to go. You get, I don't know how to describe it. I know when I was trying the vegetarian diet, when you feel like you have to go to the bathroom, you have five minutes or you're going to have a nasty accident. But at this point, I can feel a couple hours before when I got to go to the bathroom. And then whenever I get the time, I'll go and it takes me like three or four minutes and I'm out of there. Some of my friends, they'll go in the bathroom. They'll sit there for 20 minutes struggling I just don't see the whole fiber thing. It doesn't make sense to me. It's, what's the point? I don't need it. Yeah, fair enough. And have you have you had anybody, were you familiar? Because when I learned about people eating all meat, it was this the zero carb diet 
there's some people, Charles Washington, Kelly Hogan. Did you ever run into any? There's a couple called the Andersons that live somewhere also in Florida. They've been doing this now. Prior to running into some of my stuff and some of the other stuff, had you ever heard of these folks doing this zero carb diet? There's been a, what exposed me to this in the first time was running into folks, Charles Washington, Kelly Hogan, Charlene and her, and Joe Anderson, who I think they're also in Florida. Did you ever run into those people? Have you ever heard of those folks? No, I didn't hear about them until a couple of years ago. The one that I remember was, what is his name? Robert Atkins. He had that diet that was real popular for a while. And I think he had heart disease or something. I remember when he, he died of a heart attack or something. And I was laughing about it. I said, well, that'll be me when I'm in my seventies. But no, I, the Kelly Hogan. And then a lot of people now they talk about Joe Rogan and all that. I, when I thought of Joe Rogan, I thought about fear factor. That's what I remember back when I used to watch TV. But I was not aware of these people until recently, maybe a couple of years ago. Yeah, it's interesting. It could be your next door neighbor could be eating the same way you do, and you never know about it because we, we just sometimes disconnected. But yeah, Atkins, what I'm told is he didn't die of a heart attack. He slipped on ice, hit his head, was placed in the ICU, and then underwent multi-system organ failure and swelled up. And so everybody said, we, anytime you go to an ICU and you see some of these patients, they'll often be massively swollen because they pour all these IVs into them. And, and then a lot of times they just overhydrate the heck out of them. They'll, they're, they're literally, their scrotum will weigh 20 pounds. That's how swollen these people get. Have you ever had any, so now that you've been a little more public with this, has anybody ever negatively come after you and saying you're bad or evil or whatever the things that these sort of, a lot of times vegans like to say? I've had a few nasty comments come in my email and on through some of my videos, but I don't really I don't really pay much attention to it. I have tried to engage a few of them, but it's a waste of time. It doesn't bother me. I've been doing this for so long. What difference does it make? But I do, I have had one person in person. She was very mad at me because I ate that meat-based diet and she was trying to tell me how evil I was. And I got into a discussion with her. I said, okay, then we're going to have to kill every single animal on the planet if we want them not to suffer. Oh, how terrible. How can you say that? I said, well, you have predators and you have prey. If you get rid of all the predators, the prey will simply grow and grow until they starve. So you're going to have to kill them all off to start with. That's the only one I remember. And that turned into a multi-person argument. But when it comes down to it, I haven't really had that many negative comments. Okay. So you mentioned you've now, do you have maybe a YouTube channel? Sure. If you're on social media, if you don't mind, share where people can find out more. I'm not really a social media person. I do have a YouTube channel. I started two YouTube channels in 20, was it 2007? One was about energy scams because I was trying to fight those guys and that turned into a real mess and they deleted my channel. This channel was supposed to be about my car collection. That's why I call it Charger Mopar because that's my favorite car. That's the car I drive around in. That's what I really have. I have entertained the idea of taking on some social media, but my my equipment is primitive and I don't have a lot of time, so I really haven't gotten into it. But the YouTube channel is probably the one thing that I'm active in. And that's Charger Mopar. Is that the one you have? That's correct. Charger Mopar on YouTube. Okay. And having done this now for 40 years, any advice for people wanting to take this up or to start? What would you, words of wisdom you might have? It's like I've told a lot of people, if you want to make a change, you're going to have to take a risk. There's no such thing as being able to change something in any meaningful way without at least, you might have to put yourself out there. You can look at the examples of other people. I may not be the best example because I didn't start this diet as a way of getting better, but there are a lot of other people out there with their experiences and you can follow them and see how they've lost weight and reverse health conditions with this diet. You can look to me as someone who's been doing it for a really long time and did it just because he liked it. So what I would tell people is if you do decide to go this way of eating, you're not going to have to suffer for it. Your life is not going to be depriving yourself of anything good. This is something that you can do long term. And once you get to appreciate it, you may enjoy it more than anything else you've ever done before that. Okay. Said Rick, we have to go. Thank you so much for doing it and for folks for tuning in. Thanks for being part of the audience there. I appreciate it. I've got another one at three o'clock today. If you guys want to join, thanks every three o'clock Pacific time. Thanks everybody. Rick, wonderful meeting you. Take care now. All right. All right. Thank you.
Hey folks, it's Dr. Sean Baker here. If you guys are enjoying these success stories, you can become your own success story. You can do that by heading over to carnivore.diet. You can sign up for a free 30-day trial and get started today. We're looking forward to supporting you. Our community is wonderful, and we'd love to see your success.